Hey, my name is Will DePass, and I make watch traps down in New Orleans, Louisiana. I make other things too, but uh, watch traps are really my passion. Up until this point, I've just kind of dipped my toe in the whole YouTube thing, but I've been making an online leathercraft school, so I've learned a lot about videography and recording and all that stuff along the way. Still by no means an expert. But uh, I'd like to kind of put some of that towards my watch trap making and uh, just get some information out there, show you all what I do, how I do it, and why I do it. I think it's best to specialize. I mean, if you make a bunch of stuff, it's all going to be pretty mediocre. But if you focus and really hone in on one thing, you're going to get good at it eventually, whether you like it or not. Uh, thankfully, I like it. You don't need a lot of tools and machinery to make high quality watch straps. I mean, you can make them with this small selection of hand tools that I just have on my credenza right now. But if you want them to be high quality and consistent and make them in any appreciable quantity, you will need some tools and machinery. Thankfully, uh, business has been pretty good to me in my private label gigs. Uh, that's making stuff for other brands. Uh, so I've been able to invest in some really high quality machinery and tooling. And that has allowed me to get really dialed in with my watch straps. Each one comes out extremely consistent because when you're dealing with watch straps, you're dealing with very tight tolerances. A millimeter is a mile on a watch strap, especially if it's at the lug. Um, the last thing you want is some ugly gap between your watch strap and your case and seeing spring bar and all that. That's, that's disgusting. I mean, nor do you want it too tight uh, where you can't even fit the strap in the case, uh, it's a fine balance. Speaking of fine balances, uh, I've been working on balancing my videos between being like engaging and quick paced to keep you all interested and being extremely informative and going into excruciating detail. And I can already tell this intro is getting uh, a little long winded and convoluted, so my apologies. I'm all about, you know, fundamentals and foundations. And the foundation of any good watch strap is a high quality leather. And there's a lot of high quality leathers out there, but it really comes down to what the leather is best suited to. You know, you can have a really high quality leather that's stiff as a board, and that would make a terrible watch strap. You could have another very high quality leather that's limp like a dish rag, and that's not gonna make a great strap either. So the key is finding high quality leathers with the appropriate characteristics for making a nice watch strap. Not too stiff, not too floppy, you want a bit of resilience as far as, you know, resistance to the elements. But in my opinion, you also want it to age and patina and kind of grow with you and uh, all your life experiences. So as you can tell, uh, my company is called Vulture Premium. And that kind of came from the idea that I've just scavenged all these leathers from around the world and finally arrived on some really good ones that are best suited for watch straps. A few years ago, I actually went to uh, Tuscany in Italy and I visited a few tanneries over there. My favorite tannery is La Perla Azura. And I was able to go in there, check out all their tannages of leathers, talk to the people that work there, talk about their different characteristics, you know, what's best for what application, what tannages would be good for watch straps. And I was able to just get in there, get my hands all over everything, rifle through all these samples, full hides, you name it and finally arrive on some leathers that I think are like phenomenal. Leather is such a tactile thing, like you really gotta put your hands on it. You just can't gauge it from a photo, which obviously is an issue for me trying to sell leather things uh, online because all I have is photos and I guess video as well. But you just gotta get in there, you gotta put your hands on it, you gotta see how it flexes, what the grain does, what the flesh does. It's, uh, it's a whole thing. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to travel around a lot and be able to put my hands on a lot of great leathers as well as obviously order them and experiment with them as well. You know how they have that seed bank to replant the earth in case of like a nuclear disaster or something like that? I basically have that for leather. <laughs> I, uh, I've just compulsively collected leather. I'm a leather hoarder, I'll admit it, I don't care. I'm the vulture, I'll swoop in, I'll grab all your nice leathers and my talons, I'll fly back to my nest and then make watch straps out of it. So now that I've driven the point home that it's not just about high quality leather, it's about high quality leather that's suitable to making a watch strap. Now it's time to go into kind of like the process. So I order all my hides directly from Tuscany. Uh, I buy shoulders of the cow, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, they're back on their shoulders, going down to about halfway down their back, up to their necks. Each part of the cow, you know, being a living creature, has different characteristics. You know, you don't have the same skin on your face that you have on your butt. So you need to just work with these inherent characteristics in any type of skin. And you need to know what part of the animal works best for what item. 
I found shoulders to be the best for watch straps. You get very high quality, nice tight grain structure and a lot of usable leather on the shoulder. Say if you buy a side of a cow, which is a cow split down the middle, there's a lot of just garbage leather on that. The belly is trash. You know, I don't know about you, but my belly is constantly going in and out, stuff in my face, going on a diet or whatever. So uh, that skin, like it remembers that. And it's less firm, it's more squishy, it's more pliable, and it's more stretchy, which are all characteristics you do not want in a watch strap. The butt is very firm, very hard. Butts are good for belts. Uh, which I guess is just a really big watch strap, but you do need more rigidity. The back of the cow is nice leather for pretty much anything. It's, it's kind of like a universal cut. So why buy a side of a cow when I'm only gonna use 30% of it? Go straight for the good stuff, get the shoulders. And I, I buy my shoulders full thickness, uh, basically the entire thickness of the cow's skin. And that does cost a lot in shipping, I'm not gonna lie, because it's much heavier than having it split and sent at like a much thinner uh, thickness. But when you order it that thick, you can make literally anything out of it. It's never gonna be too thin. You know, so I can make a belt out of it if I want, and I have. I, I actually really like the belts I make, and uh, I should probably start selling those too, because they're awesome. And thankfully, I have a very nice band knife splitter. It's from an Italian company called Camoga, and I can make leather literally any thickness I want to like the tenth of a millimeter precision. It's it's amazing. It was very expensive, but uh, totally worth it. So we've got our really high quality shoulders. What do you do with them now? The next step is I break them down into straps. It's just easier to work with the leather that way. Um, a full shoulder of leather, you know, at like five or six millimeter thickness is actually quite heavy and a, a pain to lug around and work with and put back and all that stuff. So these straps are much easier to work with. I cut the lengths I need, I send them through my splitter, and they're good to go on to make a watch strap with. And just backing up a little bit, like even when you get a nice shoulder of leather, uh, there are good and bad parts on there. Any leather you get will have good and bad parts. Just, I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. So even though I have really nice leather to start with and I break it down into these straps, there still are areas to avoid. Um, the outer fringes of the leather and the dead center of the leather, which is the animal's neck which obviously does a lot of moving around and is a little, it's actually very dense for some reason, um, almost like calloused. It's, it's very hard. And I don't know if that's because of the tanning process of squishing down the wrinkles or if it's just like a part of the cow's life, but that's best to be avoided too. So, so I'll take my straps, I'll cut out the bad areas of the leather and just leave myself with the high quality pieces with a nice tight flesh structure and a beautiful grain. You can get into trouble, uh, trouble's probably not the right word. If you try and use some leather with like a squishy flesh side, when you conform it to your wrist, that inner radius is gonna kink and that's not comfortable and it's just poor craftsmanship, poor quality. So you really need to avoid all those bad spots in the leather because it will show in the final product if you know what you're looking for. And even if you don't know what you're looking for, the user experience will just be worse. This is engaging with your skin. You know, you, you want it to be smooth. You don't want it to be all wrinkled and uncomfortable. So let's get into how, how do I assemble these straps? I'm gonna show you all a good bit of how I make the straps, but I'll also omit a good bit because they're my proprietary secrets. And I don't really see anybody making watch straps the way I do. Each side of the strap, you know, you got the side with the holes and the side with your buckle on it. Each one of those pieces is made with a single piece of leather there's no like fillers, there's no liners, there's no like top side, bottom side leathers. It's all a single piece of leather and I've kind of developed some tricks and some custom tooling to manipulate the leather to allow me to do that. That way you don't have any liners peeling up, you don't have stuff separating, you don't have some nameless goo as a core to your strap trying to pretend that it's real leather. I'm all about keeping it simple, keeping it pure, use the great leather and minimize junctions, joints, you know, minimize all that stuff. It's a watch strap. It shouldn't be complicated. A lot of people make it complicated by trying to cut corners and using lower quality materials for stuff you're not necessarily gonna see. But I'm all about the, you know, keep it simple, keep it quality, make each side of your strap from one piece of leather. It doesn't have to be complicated. And when you do make it complicated, you create an inferior product. So once we have our straps cut to size, skived in the appropriate places and glued together, it's time to shape them to our actual watch strap dimensions. When I'm talking about watch straps, there's usually three dimensions to take into consideration. 
Uh, first, the thickness of the strap. For a large case watch, you're gonna want a thicker strap. Is it for a thin dress watch, you're gonna want a thinner strap. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff in between as well. So establish the thickness. I have my kind of universal thicknesses that go along with my lug widths that are appropriate for most watches, but feel free to reach out and ask for a custom thickness. Then we have our lug width, which is the width of the strap where it engages with your watch case. And this, this isn't something that you can just pick out at random, which, I mean, if you're watching this video and you're into watch straps, you, you obviously know this, but that's a fixed width. So you need your strap to fit perfectly in that gap between your two lugs. But what is up to personal preference is your taper. The width you want your strap to taper down to at the buckle. You can have a straight strap, say 24 millimeters at the lug, 24 millimeters at the buckle, or you could have a tapered strap, maybe going down from 24 to 22 millimeters at the buckle or 20 millimeters at the buckle. And that kind of exaggerates the size of the watch case and it's beneficial in some circumstances. Say you have like a really large wrist and your watch case maybe looks a little small on your wrist. Well then use a tapered strap and it's a bit of an optical illusion and it will magnify the size of your watch case. And you know, vice versa, if you have a really big watch and you have a smaller wrist, stick with a straight strap and it won't exaggerate the size of your watch case. If anything, it may minimize it slightly. And these dimensions need to be extremely precise because these are very tight tolerances. You want your strap to fit perfectly at your lug. You don't want any spring bar showing. You don't want it to be too tight either. So you have to make this strap a very precise width. Same with the buckle. You don't want to be fighting your strap through your buckle but you also don't want it to be you know, a hot dog in the hallway. So you can't really cut these by hand in any quantity and expect consistency. Therefore, I get steel rule dies made. I draw my watch strap tapers and patterns and everything on a CAD program and I get them CNC milled with steel rule dies. And that's not really as straightforward as it sounds either. The band knife has a certain width, it has a certain bevel and that either shrinks or enlarges your computer file that you've created. So it takes a lot of iterations of making dies, clicking through leather, and then measuring the actual result to find your offsets and tolerances that you need to build into your patterns. And not only that, when it clicks through the leather, the leather forces that knife either inwards or outwards, depending on the bevel and how the actual like band knife is manufactured. So you need to take that into account as well. And that's just something I've had to spent a lot of money on and a lot of trial and error through the years to develop these files and these dies to cut perfectly sized watch straps that fit the lugs and the buckles perfectly. And a lot of people don't take the time to do that. A lot of people even cut their shafts by hand like maniacs. And I just can't send a strap out there that's not perfect. So even though it costs a little more, um, it's worth it for me because I sleep soundly at night knowing I'm selling quality items. These dies, even though they're very sharp, require a good deal of effort to go through the leather and that's not something you can do by hand. So you need what's called a clicker press. Um, cutting out pieces of leather with dies is referred to as clicking. And you need a very strong press to force these knives through the layers of leather of your item you're making. So the next step is to take my, what I call sandwiches at this point, and click straight through them, thus creating a flush cut edge around everything and allowing me to burnish a very nice smooth edge. Um, if you glue individual pieces together that are already cut to size, you're going to have very rough and scruffy edges and it's just not going to look nice. That's why I make my sandwiches and go all the way through them. Everything about this process is geared towards consistency, quality, and setting myself up for success and finishing the strap. For my smaller straps, I use a machine stitch um, because if I were to hand stitch them, like the hand stitch is all you would see. It, it's just very large and just draws the eye straight to the stitch. And I think it detracts from just the overall look of the watch strap and the watch. But for my larger straps, you know, like 24 millimeters, 26 millimeters, 22 millimeters, that go on larger, chunkier watches like Panerai type watches, I like to hand stitch those because you can use a much bigger thread and the bigger stitch complements that style of strap and watch. Whereas on a smaller strap, it would detract from the overall look. So for machine stitching, I use really high quality threads from Japan, some special needles I've gotten to make just really nice, straight, consistent stitches. The look I'm going for is just clean and precise. 
Um, you'll see a lot of kind of like beginning leather crafters poo-poo machine stitching and say it's inferior to hand stitching, but that's most likely because they can't afford a sewing machine and don't know how to use one correctly if they could. A machine stitched watch strap is not less durable than a hand stitched watch strap. That's, that's just false. For my hand stitched watch straps, I use some pricking irons from Korea that are great. They fly through the leather, make very nice tight slits, and I'm able to execute really precise saddle stitching. And I can vary the size of the thread to make it look more rugged or more elegant depending on the customer's preference or what the project demands. Once that's out of the way, it's time to finish up the strap by adding decorative creasing and rounding off the corners of the strap and going through a process that's called burnishing which is essentially just slicking down the fibers on the edges of the cut item to make it uh, more aesthetically pleasing and more durable. So at the end of this whole process, if you're one of my customers, you receive a great watch strap made with a lot of care from high quality materials that's exactly to your specifications. You get to pick the leather, the stitch color, all of your dimensions, you know, lug width, taper, thickness, length. And through that process, and through my videos I'll be making, I think you'll just have a much better appreciation for your watch strap and you'll have a closer personal relationship with your strap and your watch. And as you use it and wear it and it weathers and ages and patinas, it just becomes all that more special.